Okay, we're good to go. Thank you all for attending tonight. I'm so thrilled to see such a enthusiastic crowd to welcome Leonardo Drew tonight. Um, I wanna begin the evening by extending gratitude to Jordan Schnitzer and his family foundation for making this exhibition a realization for the Zuckerman Museum of Art. And also to the curator of the exhibition, Loretta Yarlow, who is the director of the University Museum of Contemporary Art at UMass Amherst. Um, in addition to that, Jordan Snitzer Family Foundation provided us with generous funding, which allowed us to, of course, bring Leonardo here tonight for this talk, but also for us to bring in a number of public schools along with um, their students and their art teachers for a experiential um, exhibition tour and a workshop where all of the students, over um, 150 students came to see the exhibition, learned about paper making and also each made a sheet of paper. So we had a paper making workshop here for them. So I just wanted to extend gratitude to Jordan Schnitzer and his family foundation. Um, a little bit about the foundation. At age 14, Jordan Schnitzer bought his first work of art from his mother's um, in Portland, Oregon, Contemporary Art Gallery, evolving into a lifelong uh, avocation as a collector. He began collecting contemporary prints and multiples in 1988. Today, the collection exceeds 19,000 works and includes many of today's most important contemporary artists. It has grown to be one of the country's largest private print collections. He generously lends work from his collection to qualified institutions. The foundation has organized over 110 exhibitions and has had art exhibited at over 160 museums. And we are very fortunate, again, to have one of his um, exhibitions uh, here in our museum. Leonardo Drew was born in 1961 in Tallahassee, Florida, and grew up in Bridgeport, Connecticut. His talent and passion for art was recognized at an early age and first exhibited his work at the age of 13. He attended the Parsons School of Design and received his BFA from the Cooper Union for the Advancement of Science and Art in 1985. Solo museum exhibitions include shows at De Young Museum in San Francisco, SCAD Museum of Art at the Savannah College of Art and Design, Beeler Gallery at the Columbus College of Art and Design, and the Hirshhorn Museum and Sculpture Garden in Washington, D.C., among many others. His work is included in numerous public and private collections, including the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City, the Museum of Contemporary Art in Los Angeles, the Hirshhorn Museum and Sculpture Garden in Washington, D.C., Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art in Bentonville, and Tate London. He has also collaborated with the Merce Cunningham Dance Company and has participated in artist residencies at Art Pace in San Antonio, Texas, the Studio Museum in Harlem, among others. In 2011, he was awarded the prestigious Joyce Alexander Wine Artist Prize by the Studio Museum in Harlem. Leonardo lives and works in Brooklyn, New York. Please join me in welcoming Leonardo. <laughs> Boy, I, I, this, uh, the clapping means I have to be present now. Right? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'll tell you, um, I, you know, I, you know, I met a number of artists here, um, uh, you know, just a little while ago, and I know that they have to say, like, when we're in these kind of situations, where you're at studio and then you're talking, studio, mm -hmm. then you're talking always interesting to sort of like have to make those kind of transitions. I'm still kind of in the studio, so you guys gotta like, 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 like bear with me. But I, I am uh, what you would call like a, a real live bumping artist. <laughs> so I, I, I'm making things, even as we're talking, I'm still making things. And you know, I'll tell you, it, it's like when I see this image, it makes me stop because it's like, there's nothing like beginning, you know, and you know, when you come to a realization that here I am, like, in this image here, it's like growing up in Bridgeport, Connecticut, living in a project, uh, P.T. Barham apartment, and um, I just couldn't stop drawing. You know, it was, I was drawing on everything. And when I started drawing on test papers after school, my mother was like, you know, she had to come and get me, you know what I mean? <laughs> and give me that beat down, <laughs> because <laughs> you have to focus in school. And, you know, I, I, was, I was an addict. 
to this day, I am still an addict making things. Um, uh, you know, what I thought was art then was like these kind of things, like comic book characters. And it got to the point where DC, Marvel, you know, those guys came after me. Um, so I got that good at this. And facility is something that you have to at some point determine how you're gonna use it. Mm -hmm. And what I did was, you know, as we're looking at like, you know, where, I mean, we go from this to that, it gives you an idea of the leap of like, okay, you know, the understanding of how things come together compositionally, how colors come together, you know, uh, you know, uh, I have to make a decision. Is this art? Uh, now, keep in mind that there, there are artists here who actually, this is, you know, how we realize ourselves. For me, this was just a prettified surface. I knew there was something else beyond that. I started asking questions. Once I saw Jackson Pollock, though, that was it. All bets are off. So, you know, it's like, so if you were to think of Jackson Pollock and you think of what I was making then, you can understand, like, how I could have actually made a leap you know, from, you know, like a, 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 a believing that uh, Maxwell Parrish and Milmer Rockwell and mm -hmm. the Wyeths were, these are considered illustrators, uh, but that was what I understood art was. But once you see Jackson Pollock, it's like you are now beyond that surface, you know. And gives you some other ideas of what my, what my facility was, you know, where it was going anyway. But I decided just to tie my hands and say, okay, no more of this. And it was, just like that, it was like, find another way to make things, to create. No more painting, no more drawing, but find another way. And what I did was, I literally tied my hands and said, okay, you know, um, what can you, how can you actually redo yourself, restructure yourself, you know, into something, re you know, a new iteration of what is possible. So from that kind of facility to this kind of surface, it's, it's, um, you know, it, it's, it's strange. I look at it and I say, how could I have done, even thought to do that? To give up something that's a cash cow, which is <laughs> your facility, yeah. right? And, you know, say, okay, tie your hands. Let's find out what you can do now. So I started like cutting up like black paper, um, working with ink and, um, and just saying, okay, cause I said no more color, no more drawing and find another way. These shapes, you know, kind of led to my first sculptures, which actually this thing started off as a giant haystack. And a <laughs> I, I was living in a, uh, this, he's a apartment. At this point, I was already first year, first year uh, college. Mm -hmm. and, um, and asking questions like, okay, well, how do I sort of like realize this next iteration? And I was making this gigantic haystack built up from like uh, 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 bones of animals <laughs> and things. And a lot of, uh, we would call Africanisms. Uh, involved in like, you know, uh, how I was realizing my next iteration. It was like, he said, how are you gonna get it out of here? And I was like, oh, okay. I, I had never thought of that, you know? <laughs> so it was like, okay, chop this thing down. The haystack became like a giant nest, you know, that I could actually hopefully maneuver down the stairs. But honestly, I was never really thinking about showing anything. I was just experimenting. And so, the, I mean, you can see some of the, the, the it looks like some skull and teeth piece of uh, some animal and like uh Ugly. yeah 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 yeah. i mean this is a, that was the up, that was the uh, up close and this is this is the whole piece some antlers there but like uh, uh i mean it was like we were i was well, i mean i was it was like roadkill that i was like collecting i was not killing animals <laughs> so it was like okay there's a place where it's like quicksand mm -hmm. a place called heather hills which is up in the hamptons we would go and dig animals out of there you know and i used to like hang the uh bones out to dry outside my window not <laughs> knowing that my neighbors could see these bones, you know. <laughs> so I was like, okay, what's going on over there? And it's like, well, I'm an artist and I'm making things, you know. <laughs> so it's, there's always this explaining that hat. I mean, you, we have, you're artists here. You know what I'm talking about. So it's like with your neighbors, you always have to navigate this sort of fine line between, you know, you know he's a nut. And when you say artist, <laughs> it's like a license to be a nut, right? right? So, but yeah, this is another, yeah. It, it, you know, I, I'm looking at some, it's, okay. So to know this does no longer exist because what I end up in every doing is cannibalizing. This is at least the word that I've learned is that I, I, I'm actually a cannibal. <laughs> so I take works, you know, uh, previous works that are not necessarily successful and turn them into, use those parts as sort of like, it's part of a continuum. I just take them, take them apart, build back into them, turn them into something else. 
So um, looking at like this, which is a surviving piece, and I would call the mother piece to all of my work, which is number eight. Um, uh, and you got to know if I start with number eight, that means that probably one to seven are no longer here. <laughs> you know, they became number eight, you know. So, <laughs> so, so I started with number eight. And, um, and this was what I would say is like a, I mean, it even looks like a three-dimensional Jackson Pollock. You know, so I mean, e even though I was not necessarily recalling him, uh, or, you know, uh, like, uh, 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 you know, like, uh, you know, when I was making this, in the end, he, w he was still had that much of psychic control over how I saw things that the most successful piece that I made when I became the new me was a, a sculptural Jackson Pollock, you know. This is the next sort of um, phase, which is, you know, okay, um, you know, when I started working with sensation material, like dead things, it was like, okay, it, for me, it's like, once you touch that, it's like, I, I, I'm not gonna park it there. Plus the very idea that you're working with, um, uh, something that already evokes, because it's dead, it already evokes an emotion. So it's like, okay, that's still too easy. Same way that I, my facility was easy, I saw that that was also easy. So I said, okay, try, let's, let's try something else. Let's take all that away and still, what ended up happening was still working with decayed material. This is just rust. Mm -hmm. I didn't necessarily make that connection, so to speak, but what ended up happening was, we're gonna move forward real quick because I need to show you something. This, if you look long enough at this and the details of it, you will see a combination of this mm -hmm. and that. Now, I didn't see, I didn't, I wasn't targeting that. If you make work long enough and you find your voice, eventually, you know, you start finding these peaks and valleys and there are times when all things come together. They culminate and they become, you know, they, they kind of like, they kind of, they have you by the nose. And you being dragged, you know, <laughs> along and you being told, you know, what is actually real, you know, um, what is um, uh, concrete and, what, and who you are and why you're here. And I think that you'll, th th just showing you that can give you really a clue of like, um, and like I said, I'm not alone in this. This is the journey that all artists have to take if they're sort of like, you know, you know if they're open enough to sort of like admit certain truths about themselves. Mm -hmm. So I think that like, even with this, this uh, piece, which is like, you know, still going through my rust period, this is the first iteration of rust. This is the next phase of that. And guess what? Cotton became like a, a, a thing. And um, I don't, so this was 1992. Mm -hmm. So here it is working with that material. Here it is again working with the, the cotton. This is the same exhibition, believe it or not. This, these are all part of the same exhibition. And I'll give you a round off of what, this is the, yeah, it kind of shook things up in the city back in 92. But I will tell you, the honest God truth is that, um, uh, that uh, uh, it, it, was, it, was, it was a challenge uh, laid out to, uh, how do I say that, the, uh, uh, the art world um, at large is that uh, there's a, a brother coming out and swinging. <laughs> and they were, they were afraid of that. Because I remember Roberta Smith um, and, uh, and the New York Times, they, everyone couldn't stop writing. Mm -hmm. That's okay. Now, I'll tell you something, how I see writing, uh, uh, you know, like uh, uh, how uh, people are sort of like realizing you, uh, critics have to write about you. And uh, I had this, like when I was 13, my first, when I start, first started exhibiting, they were writing about me then. And uh, what I realized is that if you follow them, you're now off your trajectory. Mm -hmm. So I learned that early. So when they came at me back in 92, I mean, when they came at me, and I'm gonna tell you, they came at me. <laughs> <laughs> it was like, okay, you know, you, you know like, uh, this is something that they, they need to do. Mm -hmm. They need to do this with you. They need to bracket you. They need to sort of try to figure you out. But you're on this journey. You don't, it, it's not about you stopping to sort of like uh, allow anyone to sort of, you're still trying to figure you out. You know what I mean? So how can it be ahead of you and telling you how you should actually produce, how you should realize yourself? What I'm telling you, this is a life philosophy. It's not an art philosophy. It's, it's actually a, how you should choose to c conduct yourself as you're sort of moving through this short time that we have on this planet. So if someone is telling you that this is how you should be, how could they know that? Um, you need to sort of like, you know, check yourself and decide, 
this is, this is you know, I, I have to do this. I know I'm an addict, so I have to do it. <laughs> but in, when it comes to sort of like someone defining, like, you know, like, uh, like I was saying, what Roberta Smith was saying, was <laughs> she, she, she had made the decision that um, at that time anyway, uh, she came around <laughs> years later, but was like, okay, this, this guy is like uh, getting too close and we need to sort of like curtail this. And, <laughs> and uh, it, the, the, the attempt was interesting because it was not hidden. And what they were writing, uh, as what some were writing uh, uh, were, okay, uh, new Vanguard, this is like something new is happening. And on the other hand, it was like, okay, we need to sort of like keep this from happening. I think that sometime later, uh, the doors got kicked open because Kara came through, Kara Walker, uh, my boy Mark Bradford, mm -hmm. you know, like, uh, so it was, it was, it's like, you, you know, it, it's the, the flex. Now, Basquiat before that, you know, uh, he went through it. They put him through it. So that was an interesting sort of like, you know, you know, and I came in probably around the same time as Gary Simmons and, um, and uh, uh, oh my God, oh, oh, uh, uh, Glenn Ligon. And uh, so it was like pretty much three of us coming through. Uh, uh, and it was interesting how they were digesting us. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it, it took a second, but when Kara came through, it was like, okay, all bets are off. Mm -hmm. you know? And it's always interesting sort of note, I know from my perspective what was happening. Uh, how history will write that is a whole other thing. Mm -hmm. But I think that as we're sort of moving through you know, all of this, it just gives you an idea of what was happening in the early 90s. And, um, I'm still swinging, but <laughs> but this is this I'm on my little journey, uh, uh, and just so you know that this 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 piece became that piece. All these boxes, you know, it's like at, you know made for an exhibition. It's like maybe 1,200 of these boxes then became like this because nothing is sacred in the studio. So it's like if I get something back, it's like okay, what can I do with this material? So. 1,200 boxes became this new rust monstrosity. Mm -hmm. Another iteration of rust. Now, that's the only thing that I say is probably one of my greatest weaknesses is that I don't park it. So as you probably already noticed, if I didn't park it when I was an illustrator, <laughs> I'm necessarily gonna park it as an abstractionist. So, so, so rust was, was with me for a second. Yeah, I wish I owned one of these, but I, 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 <laughs> I ain't that good anymore. But I'm <laughs> it, it, I got to tell you that I, I was with uh, Mary Boone and she was able to, you know, it's like it's always important to, to at least know, you know, when something peaks and then you need to hold on. Like number eight, I own. All right. Number 14, which that first rust one I own. And at two, for two seconds, I own that one until Mary Boone came and she was, she was shrewd enough to get it away from me. <laughs> I, I wasn't smart enough to sort of like, uh, everyone know, here knows Mary Boone, right? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah, so you know, um, but I think in the end, it, it's important, I don't have, I actually don't think I own any of the Rust work, but um, they found good homes. And this was an interesting moment because I got a, a call uh, from this cat and he's like, uh, he liked to meditate in front of one of my works uh, and uh, was wondering if I would be interested in working with him on his next piece. And, um, and I was like, oh, cool. I said, well, okay, yeah, what's, what you talking about, man? He said, my name is Merce Cunningham. And I said, hold on, let me uh, call some folks and I'll call you right back. I didn't know who this guy was. So, <laughs> so <laughs> interesting. We're talking huge history and a whole other trajectory and I was like, okay, you know what? You know, like, we're gonna do something together. So his formula for working was, he allows you to do whatever you want to do. He does his thing, and then he allows the musician to also do his thing, all separate from one another. Opening night, those, all those elements come together. Huge amount of courage to sort of like say, okay, I'm gonna allow this thing to sort of like navigate its way into existence. And I say, what if it fails? He didn't care about that at all. And I said, you know what? I'm going to have to adopt that. <laughs> I'm going to have to work that into my philosophy. And to this day, I'm still like, you know, I work in parts that come together. Now, you would have thought I was already doing that. But we're talking, when you see a master at work, it's like, you know what? There is a, a whole other level of trust and self that he was talking about. He was doing this like pretty much naked in front of everybody, you know? That thing could have fell flat on his face. 
It didn't, but it, <laughs> but it could have, you know. So I just did like a large version of number eight. There are no dead animals in it. <laughs> okay, so what I, what I start, this story, that one, um, I collected, uh, it was one of the, I should tell you guys, I don't work with found objects. I actually fabricate things in the studio and, and, and treat it so it looks as though it's been found. So that's always usually a misunderstanding with my work. I think people have caught on to that now, and they're now rewriting that part because I, they always said, okay, he's working with found. This is the one time I actually did work with found objects because I, I needed to sort of realize how to sort of like bring color back into my work. As you notice, you know, like you hadn't seen color in my work, this is what, when it actually started happening. Interesting enough, um, this was at the Hirshhorn, and it was a security guard. It, security, guards are, security guards are interesting because they have this opportunity to sort of live right in front of your work like oh just like God. just that, that I mean I think that got to be bored out of their minds but this guy he was just like he decided that he was going to become a tour guide and, and anyone that stepped into that space he waited till enough of them got in there and he was going to tell them what their work was about you know and I was like you know I, I was there when he was doing it you know so he's telling these folks okay this is Manhattan and this is that and, I, and, 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 and my friend I was with a friend he was like you got to stop him <laughs> and I said no don't don't no no we're going to learn something you know, it, because this is the magic in all this is that that the, the, that if you allow the audience to become complicit in completing the work, you end up learning something too. So it's, if if you have enough like openness to sort of like say, I I don't know all the answers. I don't have all the answers here. I can make these things, but I don't necessarily have a clue. Sometimes of like okay, if you're being dragged by the nose by the, if you allow the work to drag you, you end up in every learning more things about all things. <laughs> You know, so it's, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's, it's like a, wow, to allow others in, to find themselves in the work, to allow the work to become like a mirror, it, there's nothing like that. To step back and allow a person to find themselves in the work. The, all the works are numbered for that reason. There are no titles on any of these works, so they're all numbered. So if you're looking at the work, don't look for the, 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 the tag or whatever to say, oh, this is how I should be seeing this or whatever. It's, you're not going to find that in this work. You know? So you should uh, be allowed mm -hmm. to reflect, to actually use this as a mirror. Yeah, we had a lot of questions on tours of the mm -hmm. exhibition. Uh, why, because of the, the yeah, non-title? Yeah. Uh, uh, what, were the people afraid to find themselves in the work? I know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, come on. It, 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 it's, it's easy stuff, man. It's like, if you, if you stand in front and, and you, don't, you don't vibrate, then it's okay. It's, you don't, it's okay. But if you vibrate, if, you know, you, and, and it's telling you something, then, you know, it's, it's going to drag you out and into a whole iteration of you, who you can be. So I'm, I'm not going to stop that from happening, you know. Cast paper. No okay, so there are a, a number of times when, um, where I make a decision, as you probably already know this, where it's like, okay, boom, that closed, something else is opening up. So this is like asking the question, okay, you're really getting good at this rush stuff. So now, there are artists who park it. I, I, I don't fault them for that. Richard Serra, love Richard Serra, but whenever I go and see his exhibitions, I know exactly what I'm going to get. You know, uh, you know, and, and I'm always, you know, wow, this is it's, it's, all the time he gets you, gets you, gets you. Now, you can not a smart artist will park it there. I'm not that smart. <laughs> so I'm not going to park it. I'm always saying, OK, you got really good at this. Now it's time to do something else. So it's like, OK, if I said if, if uh, you took white paper, um, uh, can you actually turn that into something? Can, can you find, you know, your voice in that material? And I did learn something. Even though this is the first iteration of like the cast paperwork, it was like, um, it felt like plaster. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if you were saw this in a museum, you would have thought this was plaster, but it's actually paper. So I said, okay, this is a failure. So it took three years off, no more showing, no more doing anything except for just making, uh, trying to figure out what, how to realize cast paper. This is like a, that, this is the same piece, believe it or not. Um, and I remember Ann Tenkin, who's, running the uh, MoMA now, she, wanted to, she was at Philadelphia, she wanted to get this piece there. 
And I told her, no, this is, I, I felt it was a failure. And I said, I need to still work it into something else. And I ended up turning into that. Because I thought that maybe glass would give me the lightness of being of the material of paper. Um, I don't think this is necessarily a, a it, it was, this was successful enough to let, let it leave the studio. So I did, this thing did go out. It didn't go out this way, but it did go out when it became this. But I still kind of felt that, I still not get the essence of the, of the, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, paper. This gets a whole lot closer, and this, this is the detail of this same piece, and that's paper. You understand what I'm saying? That has the lightness of, of being of that material, and I said, okay, success. Didn't make too many of these, but it did take three years of making these types of work. There's another one. Uh, these are the ones that I kind of felt were successful enough. Um, and then from there, it was like, okay, you know, okay, you could stop this now, you know, <laughs> you know, but it was, it was, a, it was an incredible beating is what it was. This is uh, Sienna, and you saw that piece earlier. Uh, this is a tumbling rust bag piece from, uh, from a previous 1992, and this is now like 2004 or something like that at a museum in Siena, Italy. And like um, uh, that wall, I mean on ceiling, was de definitely a challenge. So I said, you need to bring something in to sort of like, uh, uh, to activate that space, that ceiling already said everything, you know? And I'm not saying this is a success, but I'm just saying that I needed to sort of meet that, and that was my conversation I was having with that space, you know? That's not the Titanic. <laughs> 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 now, this, these, this, this piece is made up of remnants of, of, of bits and pieces from previous work. Uh, there's always, the floors are really strewn with all this stuff, uh, uh, bits and pieces of work. Um, uh, I got smart enough, actually, because folks were coming in to the studio and asked, can I take that or off the floor or whatever? And I would give it to them, and they'd take it home and frame it. And I was like, <laughs> I said, well, I, 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 wasn't, I wasn't smart enough to say, you know, that's valuable, you know? And, you know, but the fact that they, they educated me to a fact that within even within this, there's, 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 there's worlds. There's worlds, worlds within worlds. And I said, okay, all that material is charged, and you can do something with that. So you, if you look close enough at this, you probably see all kinds of different periods of, of things that I went through. So it's almost like a catalog of, it's like a, a, a hieroglyphics or braille or my language anyway. But um, that's the first iteration. There are a number of them now, one at Crystal Bridges, uh, SFO, uh, the airport there, and Facebook has gigantic version in their Frank Gehry building. Black monstrosity. Another one. We call these the black works, I guess, right? <laughs> and a white one. <laughs> yeah, the wood has been around for a little while. I'm sorry, if I'm going too fast, I mean, yeah, I stop me but uh that's Perez Perez Museum yeah I mean you know it's interesting because I, I well I think we might even have some photos I'm not gonna say anything we'll keep going because uh call it the tongue, the tongue piece <laughs> <laughs> they all is, they have working titles in the studio so when working on them it's like okay I have to say like okay we're, we're taking out the tongue piece now you know <laughs> so it's but bending wood, I mean, all these, it's just, it, it, you know, it's just, it, it, takes, it takes a while to find your voice, but when you find it, I mean, you can pretty much, like, just run it, you know? I mean, that was one thing I found with the cast paper works is that, um, you know, once I challenged that, it was like, okay, if you change the materials, it's like, can you, can, will, the work still had its voice, still had its emotional uh, weight, you know, even in white paper, it still had its heaviness, you know? So, you know, um, some people call it the dark, you know, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> but like, uh, it's an emotionally heavy sort of experience, you know? He survived. <laughs> now, this is what I'm talking about. Like, the colors are new. Really, it ex ex exploded here. Um, I did like uh, four years uh, back and forth to China, a place called Zhengzhen, uh, working with um, uh, uh, these uh, artisans who do gigantic vases, and they're working with glazes, and they're doing, all, it's all this alchemy that goes into uh, 
uh, uh, um, uh, porcelain and making these things, you know. They have these uh, gigantic kilns that are like 25 feet tall. And so I was there smashing things, you know, like, uh, and learning from them. So they were like, okay, like uh, he's smashing stuff. And they thought it was garbage in the beginning. They were like throwing it out. And I said, no, this is my work, you know. Because they, <laughs> they're making like giant vases, you know. And I was smashing the vases, you know. So, and you can see how this sort of came about because now when I came back to New York, I was like, okay, this is what I learned from them. And I will tell you, since China's like the Wild West, it's like um, a friend of mine called me and said, oh, don't be upset. But I was in this uh, clothing store in Xingnijin, uh, and, and also in Shanghai, they have um, uh, something that looks very much like your work, you know? So what, they, 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 they appropriate. And there are no, there are no, there, there, there are no uh, what do you call it, copyright, copyright laws or whatever. So I, I, listen, I, I felt that it was a fair trade-off. Because what I came away with was like this, you know? And, and they learned that smashing things actually is a can be art, you know? Like, <laughs> can be valuable, you know what I mean? So they were, they were definitely like turning into cast, my smash things into cast, you know? This, this, now this, this kind of stuff freaks me out because I am not, I don't really follow Instagram and all, but I do know that this is important stuff because it, just because it's, it's, it's not a part of my generation, this, this is how folks are digesting things now. And so seeing how the kids are like acting, uh, you know, uh, uh, up against these works and how inspired they are to do things, it's like, okay. <laughs> you say, I've arrived, you know. <laughs> I mean, look at that. That's like, what is that, you know? And even this, it's like, I mean, first outdoor uh, uh, sculpture, um, uh, I believe it or not, never even saw, and even now, I'm still not necessarily uh, considering a career of making things for out, even this is not made to sort of last outside, even though it, it traveled to at least four or five different venues um, and survived, but it's really not meant to be permanent, it's not permanent. It's gonna dissolve, it's gonna break down, and the same way that I become the weather in the studio mm -hmm. and transform materials, I was, at this point, it was allowing the actual weather to sort of take this thing on for like almost like four or five years of moving around. And like um, uh, have these parts back in the studio now with the idea that I would turn them into something. Mm -hmm. Even though the signs say don't climb, the kids are all over. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's like, it, 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 you know, they're completing the work, you know? They're involving themselves. Um, that was the joy of this project, this piece in particular, was that the uh, 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 people felt the need to sort of connect to it in ways where, I mean, they were using it as a couch, as a, you know, as a, 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 you know, a jungle gym, you know. What an experience, though. Mm -hmm. But all these colors came from my experience in China. And like I said, you know, whatever they, they, they appropriated for me, we don't say steal, appropriated, it's all good, you know. <laughs> Those are the vases in Zingazin. This is what they were making. And they were all different colors. They were standing in front of the uh, blue and white ones. But just to give you an idea of the scale, these things are like 20 something feet tall. And this is Machu Picchu. I do, I do a lot of traveling because that actually does stimulate and feed. Mm -hmm. I mean, when COVID hit, that was really a an interesting time because I was able to collect all that information I had stored. Because you don't just like take in things through your eyes, it goes into your pores. It's like, and it has to find its way out, you know? Redwood forest. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's me pushing a bale of cotton down Broadway in New York back 1991. Actually, I actually was uh, Jack Witten, who's my former teacher, had a studio over on Lisbonard. And so I'm pushing it from like 30 blocks, 30 blocks, 30 blocks, you know, and to get to his studio. So I was doing this like maybe three times a week because one, I didn't know how to drive. And it, it was like, OK, you know, how do I get I have any money? It was like, OK, how do I get material from what was it, 26th Street all the way down to Lisbonard? It was like 30 blocks. So I just put it on a dolly and pushed it. And a smart photographer caught that. And he said, this guy does this every like other day or whatever, pushing his bill of cotton. And so he approached me and said, it's all right if I like, photograph you or whatever. And he caught this, I mean, obviously, very um, uh, uh, 
you know, uh, intense political image, you know, of brother pushing a bale of cotton down Broadway. But it's like, and there, there are details of this too. I'm not sure if they're in here, but it, it was a monster shoot, you know, and I'm glad he caught it. That's a studio story. <laughs> but I think that's it. All right. Yeah, we call that we're, we're, um, Island of Sanity and a Sea of Chaos, you know? But it, it's like um, I can actually make sense of things in there. Yeah, but it's, uh, it's alive, you know? OK. Any questions? <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. I, 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 I'm not scripted, so <laughs> I am not scripted. So, <laughs> so if I went this way and that way, whatever, that's just the way it is. But if you got questions, <laughs> I'm, I'm wide open. I'm wide open. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which one? Oh, those are just like uh, back in the day. I would like make. I, I would spend like like 16 hours on the table saw cutting up little boxes and things. And you know, uh, these days, honestly, I'm not doing all that kind of crazy work. I have helpers now, um, but you know, it, to, you know, my body now is starting to break up, break down because of the kind of bone breaking work, <laughs> hammering, and like uh, I think the last superhuman thing that I did was probably about. By like like a like half a year ago, I was in Costa Rica collecting rocks, walking around like with a suitcase, uh, collecting rocks off the train tracks. You know, like uh, uh, the, for whatever reason, they throw, they 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 do all this porcelain, beautiful porcelain tiles, but they throw them out along the train tracks. I have no idea why they do that, but it was it's 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 a gold mine for me. So I I, I was out there like collecting. And I said, okay, how do I get all this material back to New York? You know. The first time I tried to get it by way of like taking it on the plane, and they wasn't having it. I was like, what's? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I got to get smarter. So I started using DHL to ship all this stuff back. But the way I was getting it was like, you know, I had to like, you know, like get a whole bunch of it, like uh, at, you know, like uh, uh, different times, uh, store it in different areas, you know, and then like collect it, get it over to DHL, put them in boxes, and ship them back. But it was, it, was, it was crazy. It was crazy work, baby. You know, and like, uh, I still feel it, you know? Mm -hmm. But it was, it was necessary, and the kind of materials that you end up in every getting when you put your body out there, it's like, there are rewards for that, you know? So, yeah. When I came to your studio over the summer, you were talking about the influence, like how color has come back into your work. And mm -hmm. you talked a lot about the travels that you took to Cuba. Mm -hmm. Could you maybe talk uh, a little bit about Cuba, that? I mean, oh my God, Cuba. I'm glad you brought that up because I, I, I got to say, but since I'm not scripted, there are a lot of, there are a lot of holes. <laughs> but Cuba was a big one. You know, like uh, I was there in Havana, um, uh, uh, you know, just exploring. Um, Cuba was one, another one of those places where it's surreal. Because, I mean, they're driving around in these, like, cars <laughs> that are, like, from the 50s, you know? It's like, and the, and the, the kind of uh, uh, disintegration of, of uh, the buildings, because there's no one there to sort of, like, um, uh, uh, repair any of these beautiful structures. You know, no one has those skills. So they're allowing these buildings to de uh, deteriorate because of the salt, the sea salt. And of course, they, they look like people are living inside my art. You know, I was like, oh, this is, <laughs> this is fantastic, you know? So, color from China, color from Cuba, you know, all this from traveling, you know, and like I said, you're taking all this information. Um, my first take on how you could be actually affected uh, by something, you know, uh, 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 so powerfully, you know, and then come back, not even knowing how you're affected, but then actually because you're an artist, you end up creating, you're not, I don't base my work on anything in particular. But when I was in Angori Island in Senegal, mm -hmm. which is where you know they you held uh, you know our ancestors in these catacombs before they put them on a ship, you know, mm -hmm. they ship them over here and all over the place, and it's like uh, you know it was it was heavy, monstrous, mm -hmm. you know, and your body is taking in an information. Now, if I was a writer, be writing about it. If I was a you know a musician, I'd be playing music about it. But I'm an artist, so it's like. That information is going in, it has to find its way out. Mm -hmm. 
my way of speaking about it is like you get to the studio and just let it all hang out, you know? And I will say that this piece, da -da 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 -da, let's go way back, definitely absolutely influenced by that situation. And when you see it, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. A monster, this one. If that's not claustrophobic catacombs, I don't know what is. And, you know, and I did not set out to make this piece based on that. It was like maybe it took a year or something like that before this piece came along. Um, but afterwards, some time later, I was like, you know, oh, I know where that came from, you know? Now, I'm not saying that you guys have to know. I'm telling you this, but don't tell anybody else. <laughs> but that's what that's about. <laughs> And that's a heavy experience. And I think that if you're, like I said, if you're allowing the art to pull you, then it will tell you what it's about. I'm not telling you what the work is about. The work is telling me what it's about. And then I sort of like, oh, I think that's what just happened, you know? And, you know, I, I, I can probably go through all these and I can probably say something happened at this point to sort of make this occur, you know? Um, uh, I'm not gonna do that. <laughs> <laughs> because what you guys will do is go, oh, I know exactly what this work is about. You're going to go back and tell folks that this was about catacombs, but I'm just telling you <laughs> that that was my, it, that's how your, your body's taking in information and it has to give it out. So it's taking in not only through your eyes, but through your pores, and you're like a, re, you're, you're an antenna receiving information like this, and it's got to come out. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, this, these pieces? Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. No, no, no. I'm saying that um, I would love for us, this is a great point for us to move into the gallery to address that because I think it would be wonderful for us to, to mm. speak in front of the paper pieces. Yeah, we can do is that. that. Okay for everybody? Yeah, yeah. Uh, trying, mm -hmm. you know I mean, failure and, and truth about like, okay, you know, what was that about, you know? Because that's what end up, inevitably what ends up happening is you now have to define what that other journey was in order to sort of actually make something of this next hit, you know? So, you, you know, you have to sort of start dissecting um, uh, your previous journey in order to sort of realize the next step. And it takes a second. I mean, and it, it, it's, it's like being whipped, <laughs> you know, but it's, it's for me, it, it, there's a, there's a, there's a um, pleasure principle in that, um, uh, that you're, 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 you're attempting to add something else to this language. And it's not just my language. I mean, it, we're, we're a part of a collective. And um, uh, if you start thinking in terms of that largesse, it's like, well, you know, I'm standing on the shoulder of Jackson Pollock and all these others that came before me. So how do I add on to that? So it's, it's up to me to sort of like, don't park it. Do not park it. There are enough people who are parking it. That's okay. And they're doing great stuff. That's okay. But you can be at least, you know, sacrifice this, enough of this, so that we can all get to that next place together. So that means, you know, you, know, you can hand this over. You know what I mean? I could have parked it at Russ, but it's like, you know, maybe there's something else. Maybe there's something else. You know, another artist can come along and do that, but you're still here. You can do it. You can do it, you know? And that's one thing, just from being in Leo's studio a couple summers ago, mm -hmm. I, I don't feel like you do park it. I mean, you have this energy and this drive to go beyond and take the material one step further than where you think it has been or achieved. And it's evident just in your studio with everything that you're trying out. Um, I feel like there's 
just this wonderful spirit of acceptance of failure in order to to get further with the work and take the material further. Yeah, but but I, but I will let you guys know is it has nothing to do with courage. <laughs> now, don't mistake that because I had an interesting phone call with someone from Art Forum who wanted to talk about Jack Whitten and my relationship with him. And he started out to say that wasn't it brave of Jack to, um, to, 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 to keep working, keep, you know, keep pushing, you know, like uh, even though no one's paying attention to his work. I said, I had nothing to, what do you, I said, like, what are you talking about? You know, with this, nothing to do with bravery. He has to do that, you know? He's, a, he's an artist. It's like, you know, like, uh, you know, I, I didn't understand where that, you know, that he could not understand that this has nothing to do with courage, you know? And that was, I think that's, that's, a, that's a, a mistake that a lot of folks who are not making art will always make, is that we're on to some kind of like, uh, you know, we're in uh, uh, this terrain that's like, we, we're in that terrain because we, we want to be in that terrain. <laughs> you know, we want to discover. We want to find out what's next, you know? And, um, and if no one's paying attention, that's okay too, you know, but do not look for rewards, you know? the paperworks, which I would love if we could all, like, just come into the gallery and have Leo talk a little bit about the handmade paper pieces, yeah. if that's okay.